Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Comrades, a podcast discussing current events, theory, and action through a radical lens. What's up, y'all? Pearson here, back with your weekly edition of Coffee with Comrades, and boy, do we have a show for you. This week, I sat down with Brandon, Jaden, and Koi from the Info Shop to talk about indigenous mutual aid, moving beyond anarchism, and kinship. But before we jump into the main event, here's a couple quick announcements. This program is made for workers by workers and is supported by listeners just like you. If you dig this podcast, if the conversations and discussions that we have speak to you, please consider signing up to become a monthly sustainer by going to www.patreon.com forward slash coffee with comrades to support this ongoing independent media project. We are so deeply grateful to each and every person who believes in this program enough to support our work from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping this show afloat. If you do decide to sign up, you'll unlock a whole slew of awesome bonus perks. Access to early and bonus episodes, behind the scenes looks at the making of the podcast, and you'll receive an invite to hang out with us in our Discord server. Depending on what tier you sign up for, you can even unlock access to our bi-monthly zine, Cold Brew Chronicles. Speaking of which, we just put out our 10th issue of the zine last week, featuring an essay I wrote almost a decade ago on the efficacy of representative governments, or the lack thereof. On that note, it's probably worth mentioning that if you're listening to this episode the day it comes out, it's Election Day 2020. No, this is not some milk toast plea to go out and vote, though go for it if that's your thing. Rather, I wanted to direct your attention to some resources put together by our friends in Rebel Steps, who've created a Spotify playlist for the election on what to do in the event that civil unrest hits your city. You can check out the link in the show notes. Now, I know a lot of folks are really concerned about this particular bourgeois election and the violence that appears increasingly likely regardless of its outcome. If you plan to get out in the streets and mobilize, whether as a protest against Trump, Biden, or the whole damn rotten system, here are some tips from the Channel Zero Network on staying organized. The Channel Zero Network has some reminders on how to stay safe while out in the streets. Bring buddies and don't let them out of the range of your voice. Write a legal aid number on your body so you can get help if you get arrested. Be sure to know your buddies' legal names and birthdays. You'll need these to help find them if they're arrested. When moving around, walk. Don't run. Stick together. Turn off your phone while out in the streets to avoid surveillance of your location and so as not to have your unlocked phone taken by the authorities or other bad actors. Try your best not to stick out in a crowd. Cover up tattoos with clothing or body paint. Cops will use footage from the protest to try to identify you. Wear clothes that are good for moving quickly. Avoid wearing jewelry and wear closed-toed shoes. Wear your mask at all times, even if you're talking to someone, in order to guard yourself against surveillance, COVID-19, pepper spray, and tear gas. Avoid wearing contact lenses. Bring goggles of some kind in case of tear gas or pepper spray. Consider wearing bike helmets as police often cause head injuries with batons and other weapons. Don't take photos or videos of people doing anything illegal or with their faces uncovered. Whenever possible, film the cops, not the protesters. Only put water in your eyes. Don't use milk or baking soda or anything else. Clean water is the safest thing to use at a protest. If possible, bring a water bottle to drink from and a water bottle to flush out the eyes of any comrades who are maced or tear gassed. And white comrades are encouraged to follow the lead of black and brown comrades as they bear the brunt of state brutality. The Channel Zero Network sends you all solidarity. Stay safe out there and never stop fighting for a better world. As always, Coffee with Comrades is proud to be part of the Channel Zero Network and the Rev Left Radio Federation. If you're looking for practical survival skills following this election, check out Margaret Killjoy's excellent podcast, Live Like the World is Dying. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Killjoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to the jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network.
No matter what happens today, tomorrow, or in the weeks and months ahead, know that the struggle for liberation and justice will never be won at the ballot box. All we have in these times of trial and turmoil is one another. So hold fast to your friends and your comrades. Get organized and stay wild out there. All right, I think that about does it for our announcements for today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce episode 109 of Coffee with Comrades. Through kinship, we are strong. Featuring the K Info Shop. Well, on this week's edition of Coffee with Comrades, I am thrilled to be joined by members of the K Info Shop. Welcome on the program, y'all. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Would you guys mind uh, introducing yourselves for the listeners? Hello. Um, everybody, folks from Coffee with Comrades, my name is Jaden Willetto, and I am from Goat Springs on the Navajo Nation in so-called Arizona. Um, I'm Koi Bahi from the greater Wind Rock area in um, so-called Arizona. And I'm happy to be on with you from Coffee with Comrades. Yeah, it's a she brand of banali dasha jene. Kinya ani dene and a slow or ze tajini dene a basha skin. On a rahni dene a dasha chair or toba hat dene a dasha nere. Kits ili a do tis dos and dej kis de nasha. Then a hustin a good egg on the schle. Name is Brandon Banali and I am of the dene and Hopi people. And uh, thank you for having us on Coffee with Comrades and uh, uh, looking forward to today's conversation. I am too. It's going to be awesome. I've been really looking forward to uh, talking with y'all ever since I heard about the info shop. Um, for folks who may not already be aware, can you tell, me, tell us a bit about like, you know, how the info shop got started, um, you know, what its min info shop, like what its mission is. And then, you know, maybe for people who are uninitiated, like what, what is an info shop? Maybe that's a good place to start. So my partner who, her name is Red Miller Cody and I are the co-founders of the info shop collective. And he did a, he gave a pretty good try there. 
it's a such a it's such a short word, but it includes like a lot of the intricacies of the net language. So the Geh Info Shop was founded in 2017 uh, by my partner Red Miller Cody and I, and uh, she herself is a pretty prominent figure in Diné society, Navajo society, as well as the larger society. Um, so it was formed out of frustration for a lack of like a truly radical space to do what we felt were to be more meaningful or impactful organizing within Diné territory. Uh, people, so for an info shop, for example, for me myself, I've traveled around the world. Uh, my background is I'm a cybersecurity person. So I've been doing the cybersecurity industry for the past almost 20 years now. And in my friend? previous and in my previous job, I had moved back from a very large city in the Southwest back home to the Navajo Nation. And so for folks who don't know how large the Navajo Nation is, it's larger than the state of West Virginia. Um, and within the middle of the Navajo reservation is also the Hopi reservation, Hopi territory. So it's quite a unique space uh, purposely built to, to uh, foster uh, the antagonization of between Diné and Hopi people. But anyway, so when I first moved back home, we had decided we were feeding folks the unsheltered um, in a border town. And for those who aren't familiar what border towns are, they're typically settlements that used to be either military outposts or trading posts where a city began to evolve around them. And they typically are located on the borders of, Nav of indigenous reservations or reserves. And they're typically located where there's a lot of resources, natural resources. So for example, uh, a lot of the board towns in this area are near natural lakes and springs and rivers um, so that they get first dibs before you know, those natural resources come towards us. And uh, so we used to go to this border town in Gallup, New Mexico, which is about 30 miles or fit, I'm sorry, about 20 miles uh, west of Window Rock, which is where I'm located now. And uh, there's quite a sizable population of unsheltered uh, indigenous people, not just Diné. Um, you know, there's other Pueblo people as well and other indigenous people from around the so-called United States that tend to drive or find themselves in that area. And uh, we would just set up a pop-up tent and heat up some soup and warm burritos and coffee and just start serving food to the people. Um, and that all stemmed from an incident that happened in 2014 when two Navajo men were brutally murdered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, they were beaten to death by three Hispanic teenagers and uh, one, there was three men that were beaten, two of them were severely beaten and died from the injuries managed to escape. And uh, the one who escaped was tracked down like a day later by I believe an ABC news reporter. And uh, he was basically sitting in his car and afraid of his life for his life. Um, she, the, the news reporter, I think she had like cell phone video footage of the interview with him. His name was Skeets. That's what his name was on the street. And the two Navajo men who were murdered were Key Thompson and Allison Gorman. And Skeets referred to them as his uncles because he was the younger of the two. And he said this really profound thing. Um, reporter was asking him questions and he was still in grief and shock and wasn't really looking into the camera, was still suspicious and paranoid about where he, where he was at because he was still in fear of his life, pretty much traumatized from the beating that he had seen and tried to stop. Um, and so that beating is part of what we call like a tradition of Indian rolling. Uh, you know, Indian rolling is where typically in white settlements, border towns where white folks or settlers would drive around and mercilessly, mercilessly uh, beat and uh, murder indigenous people uh, in those towns. And it happened, this isn't like something that happened in the 40s and 50s, which is still relatively new, but this has happened uh, the most severe, which before this incident was in Farmington, New Mexico, which was another border town that was built uh, from a man camp, um, literally built from man camp because of the amount of resource extraction that occurs in Farmington, New Mexico. And so you had a lot of people who 
have that mining cap mentality, build a city and continue to drive around and antagonize and brutalize indigenous people. So from that brutal event, um, two things happened. One was that the Red Nation had formed. And the second was that the Canfa shop, uh, the, my partner Red Mill and I also began to form our own group. And so the Red Nation and Canfa shop kind of like intertwine. Although we're not officially part of each other, but you know our struggles are interrelated as well as our, car our relatives and comrades within each organization. Um, so the info shop started because uh, it was in response to the brutal men being murdered. So we started feeding people in the streets and trying not to proselytize or evangelize or convert them to any type of ideology, uh, basically not placing uh, conditions on the aid that we, that we give them uh, and provide. But also in 2016, of course, Standing Rock happened. And a lot of us, like Jaden, myself, uh, and others in the info shop uh, collective, were up there uh, many times providing mutual aid and support there as well. And the biggest event on the Navajo Nation is the Navajo Nation Fair. <laughs> so uh, this happens, it typically happens in the first week of September. And uh, it's the largest gathering of Indigenous people within the so called United States. I'm not even kidding. So and it happens in Window Rock, the capital of Navajo Nation. And, um, you know, typically the, the, the population in Window Rock is about seven to 10,000 people, which is pretty large for an indigenous uh, city. But during Navajo Nation Fair, it's like 50 to 80,000 people. And so the, the, it's, it's just a large amount of indigenous people who are here just to enjoy the fair. And so that was, a, and yeah, thanks. And that was, a, and that was prime time to you know, bring more awareness for the Navajo solidarity with our Archeti Shakoan relatives and the frustration of trying to get into the parade, of trying to find a space to do banner making, to talk about Hua, to have a forum to discuss why we should continue to build the Nest solidarity with our Archeti Shakoan relatives. Uh, that whole process was so um, depressing because it wasn't really an avenue there. Uh, so that's how the info shop was born uh, out of this like urgent need to find like a truly radical space that could allow us to be unapologetically uh, political without having to worry about, uh, we're not a 501c3 either, we're not a non nonprofit. Uh, we reject, you know, that method of organizing, although we do benefit from some of the, the elements of it because uh, that's just the way the world is. We do live under capitalism. Yeah, we do live under capitalism. Uh, it, there's no way around it at this time uh, as we continue to you know, destroy this monster among us. But uh, my, part my partner and I put out this call out for other folks to be part of the collective. And uh, yeah, and a lot of people joined, like super radical, awesome uh, people from the area came and and uh, he did my partner's call to like join a truly radical space where we can unapologetically be who we are as Diné people. That's amazing. That's so cool. Um, I and I assume uh, Jaden and Koi, you were two of the folks that answered that call. Um, would y'all mind, you know, talking about like what the info shop means to you, like personally, and and, and kind of like you know how y'all got involved? Well, um, I'm relatively new to the info shop compared to like Brandon and um, Brad Ma. Um, I joined, I think it was last year, just because, like Brandon said, there was really no place to be radical anywhere on the reservation. Like the Nafo reservation is a, such a huge place, but there's really no political organizing. The only organizing that really happens is mainly like on the church levels and like the churches like are really influential. And I feel like that just like, that to me was like really like depressing me that like there was nowhere to go. And I had no idea that the info shop was there until um, another collective member like showed me what it was about and I started helping out. That's fantastic. What about you, Jaden? I remember back in 2017 when the info shop opened up and like Koi said, there was really no spaces like this anywhere on the Navajo Nation. And 
utilizing some of the classes that they offered and some of the spaces that they held for um, the Nefem and queer folks, and as well as um, Navajo language and culture classes. And they offered these things um, to the community and there was always sort of like a regular um, audience of people that would come in and utilize these classes and resources. And that's where I kind of started to develop my own thinking about how I imagine or how I want to live life as a Dine person and to basically enact kinship in my life and to the relatives around me. I'm really excited to chat with y'all a, a bit more about um, your your ideas about kinship. I mean, it, it comes in from the name, right, of Kaez, like it, through kinship, we are strong. And, and, and I'm, I'm excited to, to dig into that with you. Um, I, I had the good fortune of talking um, with Nick Estes, who works with the Red Nation, um, who y'all are, um, I understand, affiliated with. And so I, I can't wait to dig into that idea because I think it's such a rich one. Um, and it's one that has fascinated me more and more uh, as I've read about it. Um, but, but before we get there, I, I was wondering – if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how COVID-19 has impacted y'all specifically, because I understand that the coronavirus pandemic has really particularly afflicted indigenous communities like the Navajo Nation incredibly brutally. And so I was curious if y'all could maybe comment on how white settler colonialism and, and capitalism have exacerbated the pandemic in Navajo land. Yeah. So when COVID hit, I think Brandon, another person we were working with, started to give out a lot of the food that we had at the info shop. It was like all in the pantry. And all of that food like went pretty fast. And then we started working with another organization. And we started um, helping with the relief efforts, giving out um, food boxes that were enough for like two weeks. And so that's just like, we just dropped everything and started like focusing on that and just like doing that at one point was higher than New York's for like the population as small as ours is. As I was preparing for this interview, I remember reading that one of the particular like afflictions um, that settler colonialism has kind of forced and thrust upon the Navajo Nation is the like lack of of clean water. And and I understand that many folks in the Navajo Nation live on about 30 gallons of water a day compared to the, you know, 100 gallons of water that are consumed in the average household of the so-called United States. And I know that, you know, obviously thanks in, in no small part to the courage and militancy of the folks that were fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline, the the mantra water is life has has become a, a really ubiquitous chant for water protectors and, and land defenders all across the Americas. And uh, just a moment ago, um, Brandon mentioned that uh, Jaden, you had gone up with uh, the some of the folks from the info shop um, to, to work with those water protectors. And so I was wondering if you could maybe comment on you know, this uh, idea of, of, of the lack of, of clean drinking water, the lack of um, potable water in the Navajo Nation and, and how that has um, impacted y'all and, and, and what that's like, uh, you know, even on a daily basis. I, I think it's something that a lot of folks, myself included, take for granted as having potable water. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so on the Navajo Nation, only 60% of residents our households have running water. The remaining 40% of Navajo Nation residents must haul water many miles for their families and for their livestock. And they tell us that hand washing is the best way to prevent infection from COVID-19. Yet these water sources are located many miles away and many water sources are contaminated with toxic metals like uranium and arsenic. And this resource extraction and exploitation that came from settler colonialism continues to deplete much of our direct water access. And a lot of our water comes from deep aquifers and natural springs and rivers and lake systems that are being depleted. And I think the crisis of anthropogenic climate change 
which is also caused by capitalism, is causing, is exacerbating this by causing drought and a lack of rainfall um, in grazing areas that are meant to feed our sheep, our livestock, which is also a huge part of Dene livelihood. And it becomes extremely hard for people to support themselves and when there's a shortage of water and the lives, lands, and natural rights of Dene people have been sacrificed so that the capitalist economy of the so-called United States can thrive. That's a great answer. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar with the history of the Southwest, like the, the development or overdevelopment of the Southwest is that it was built literally by the blood and lives of Diné and Hopi people. Um, so in 1911, in the early, in the late 1890s and 1910s and early 1900s or 20th century, uh, a lot of resource expo uh, exploration was done and they had found that you know, this area that they had confined indigenous people to was actually very rich in resources such as coal, uranium, natural gas, and oil, and so on. And so in order to, to develop the Southwest, to build these unnatural metropolises known as Los Angeles and Phoenix and Tucson, Las Vegas, and so on and so forth, that they had to get water to these areas and what they had decided to do, they came up with this grand plan called the Central Arizona Project that would divert, divert water from the Colorado River to Phoenix and to Los Angeles and to Tucson. And, you know, would also pave the way for diminishing our water rights so that cities like Los Angeles and others downstream from the Colorado River could thrive. And uh, so this plan was put in place where they needed energy, enough energy to pump to run the pumps that divert the water from the Colorado River. And uh, so through the, the canal system built called the, again, the Central Arizona Project. And uh, so it started off as early as the 1920s when there was no formal governance on the Navajo Nation. Uh, in fact, Diné people had rebuffed numerous attempts by uh, extractive industries to get to the oil and coal and and uh, natural gas or uh, uranium resources. And so the United States, you know, of course, grew frustrated with this and used their own loopholes to create what's called the, I guess would be the first formal type of governance for the Navajo Nation called the Navajo Business Council. It was basically a bunch of, was basically a bunch of handpicked Navajo people who were friendly towards the United States and signed off on oil and coal and gas leases eventually culminated into the uh, coal mining that had happened in an area where a lot of my family is from called Black Mesa, Arizona. And uh, a coal fired power plant was built near Page, Arizona. And coal from the Navajo Nation was used to power that power plant to give power, mainly to power the, the canal pumps and to also provide power and also provide coal to other coal-fired power plants in Phoenix, Los Angeles, and so on. Simultaneously, while that's happening, while coal, coal is being mined, and it's a very water uh, intense uh, delivery system that they're using. Uh, they're using a coal slurry line, which pumped like 300 gallons of water per minute from some of the freshest water on earth called the N aquifer, which is beneath the, the Black Mesa uh, Peabody operations. So on one hand, like thousands, like millions of gallons of water is being pumped out to support coal mining so that so that the Southwest could thrive. Uh, and the other end of the spectrum is uh, of the extractive spectrum is the uranium mining that was also occurring. And uranium mining was, of course, extractive industries are always racist endeavors. So uranium mining was promised as a, an economic driver, you know, to give jobs to indigenous people. But what typically happened was the most dangerous jobs in these mines was given to the Navajo people. Uh, typically the white workers would stay back after a mine was blasted. And then the Navajos were told to go in there, you know, with all this irradiated dust 
and particles in the air to bring out chunks of rocks um, and you know put them in these like binding carts and hand them out and in that process uh, a lot of our lands were um, explored for uranium mining so there are literally like over 3,000 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation um, 500 have been identified and so of course all of this is like sleeping in to our water resources because uh, these these where these uranium mining happen it wasn't like in a flat area uh, it was typically in the mountains you know which is where we get our water from the trickle down from uh, like if we were to follow the weather patterns and so in uh, 1979 the largest uh nuclear accident uh, within the so-called United States didn't happen at Three Mile Island. It happened on the Navajo Nation, uh, the Church Rock, uh, uranium, uh, uh, uranium uh, tailing spawn spill, where there was a tailing spawn, the dam broke, it was an earthen dam, and over 97 million gallons of toxic sludge uh, poured into the Rio Puerco River system. And so Church Rock, that's called the Church Rock Uranium uh, Tailing Pond Spill. And so to give you an idea of where that's located at, if people are familiar with like where the Four Corners area is, where the so-called states of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico meet, if you were to go about 80 miles south of there on the New Mexico side is a town called Church Rock, New Mexico. And that's where a lot, one of the largest uranium mining operations happened uh, was occurring until the spill happened. And so right now there's uh, funding to get at least 500 of the abandoned uranium mines um, cleaned up to whatever extent they are able to be. Uh, so in the end of the day, we're left with extractive industries that are either pumping water to be intoxified through coal slurries or we're having to deal with like permanent uh, irradiation and the poisoning of our water resources from abandoned uranium mining. And so there's a, <laughs> there's a lot that contributes to the, uh, you know, as we we're saying earlier, like how to settle our colonialism play into this. Well, it's always about land. It's always about the dispossession and disenfranchisement and displacement of indigenous people so that settlements can build up their, or so-called develop their uh, their states or their infrastructures at the expense of indigenous people. And uh, you know, there are numerous US policies that contribute to this, uh, you know, and I often say that we didn't choose this, right? We didn't choose to, to live in so-called poverty. We didn't choose to have our waterways poisoned. We didn't choose to have our water rights diminished. We didn't choose to have our uh, lands that are fit for agriculture to be taken from us. Um, we didn't choose any of this. We didn't choose to live this way, uh, to live unhealthy and then undignified lives. You know, there are pol US policies in place right now that prohibit us from living self-determined, healthy and dignified lives. And uh, it's either written by old men who are dead or it's being written now by old men who are alive and they, they sit in seats of Congress. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. And that's what really exasperated the current pandemic that we're facing now is, uh, you know, acts of like, like Jaden was saying earlier, you know, we're being told to wash our hands, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a water intensive thing to do that washing our hands when water is so hard to get in the first place or when people had to literally choose between their livestock or washing their hands and uh, you know everything else that they typically use water for. And the water that we do have also isn't the best water. Um, you know, it's high in a lot of different minerals and high in a lot of different, like arsenic, for example, which is a naturally occurring element, but we don't have the resources to you know look for water elsewhere because it's been either denied by us by our diminished water rights or it's been irradiated from uh, the thousands of abandoned uranium mines that exist in the Navajo Nation, or it's been over pumped from extractive industries such as Peabody Coal. Um, so that's one part of it. And other parts of infrastructure are also like, for example, roads. Um, when we're doing mutual aid, we're lucky if we're driving to a home that 
has a paved road. Oftentimes it's it's paved to a certain point and then 70 to 90% of it is driving these deeply wetted roads to get someplace uh, with very vague uh, directions to get there. And even the internet, uh, internet access is very hard to, so does, is, is uh, very unstable because we only have like two providers here and uh, there's not much uh, you know, options available for us to have access to high speed internet. And so there's a lot of things that contributed to why COVID-19 um, has hit us hard. So that's the infrastructure part, but also the, the lack of grocery stores on the Navajo Nation. And within the Navajo Nation, there's a population of about 270,000 Diné or indigenous people, which includes uh, Hopi people as well, non-Navajos. And we only have 13 grocery stores. And we have even less hospitals uh, we have 10 hospitals and about half of those are considered clinics. So they're not full, they're not full hospitals. So if someone has very uh, intense or um, is, is, in a, is facing COVID-19 and often the hospitals don't have the resources here, even the ones that are very well equipped often don't have the resources to take care of that patient properly. So they're often flown out to larger hospitals in the larger cities outside of Navajo Nation. So it is a lot. <laughs> no, no, I, there is, <laughs> you, you stole the words right out of my mouth, Brandon. There is a lot. And, and, and it's a daunting list of things, but it really speaks to this reality, right? That like, you know, I, I, I so often I fear folks think that settler colonialism is this historical phenomenon, right? If, the, you know, to the extent they even think of it at all. And I'm, I'm struck as I almost always am when I have, uh, conversations and, and dialogues with indigenous comrades about the international parallels between indigenous peoples here in the Americas and the Palestinians under occupation by the Israeli state. And Brandon, before we jumped on the call, I saw in your video that you guys had a Palestine flag hanging in the info shop um, right there over your, your right shoulder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I I know your focus at the info shop primarily seems to be on community organizing, right? And, and, and serving the Dinesh and, and the Hopi people um, that, that live in your neighborhood. But I was curious if y'all had any international perspectives to share on the way that settler colonialism continues to coerce and conjole indigenous peoples in the modern era. Well, you could just look up what's happening in Bolivia or what happened in Bolivia. When so say more about that, Koi. What do you like mean by that? Like when the U.S. came in and staged the coup against Evo Morales and the government, just for lithium extraction for electric cars. Yeah, no, that's a that's a perfect example. Um, not maybe not perfect. Perfect feels like the wrong word. Um, that's a very uh, that's a very timely example. Um, maybe is a better word for it. So the Palestinian flag was actually we had a visit from the Palestinian youth movement. Uh, they become a great friend of ours and are located within so-called California. And Koi brought up a good example too of, you know, how in, as indigenous people, we should share Bolivian solidarity uh, with our global South relatives. So the parallels I see, uh, you know, as you said earlier, like people um, typically view settler colonialism as something that happened in the past, but as we all know, it's a structure. It's an ongoing event that's happening right now and happens every day and within our lives. It's a, uh, you know, like I said, there are US policies that are structures of settler colonialism, um, capitalism, uh, the extraction of land, body and lives from border towns uh, of indigenous people and so on and so forth. Uh, so with the Palestinian, fo uh, Palestinian relatives, uh, the same people, uh, I think it's called the Ebrit Corporation, the same people who are building the walls and surveillance technology uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza are the same people building the walls and surveillance technology at the so-called US and Mexico border with our Tohono O'odham relatives. Um, you know, the, the parallels uh, exist because of imperialism, uh, because of imperialism's reach. So because imperialism is an international monster, so must our struggles as indigenous people be with international solidarity as well. And uh, I think a lot of that misconception is that I think, so from my perspective as a Dene anarchist, 
it seems a, a lot of the organizing within indigenous territories seems to be very um, land-based centric in regards like the return to land, so to speak. Um, and it seems to be about the, the, the discourse is usually around, you know, we have to we come back to the land and we have to farm again and do all this and that, which is great. I mean, learn the language, learn to farm and do everything else, but, you know, to realize that, you know, we don't, those, those instances of what they view as decolonization they're, they don't exist within like a magical bubble or shield, right? Like just because I have a garden and I have sheep and I, and I speak my language doesn't mean that settler colonialism and US imperialism ceases to exist outside the boundaries of my garden or my homestead or whatever. And so I think a lot of what people perceive as decolonization within the indigenous so-called left, even that term left and right I have issues with, but that's my own personal preference <laughs> no I, I i feel you there <laughs> i i also have similar holdups but but go and, on yeah so you know there's so does that does that concept of it's it's a basically our life ways have been defanged and declawed so that, that we're not threatening to the status quo or they're not threatening to the settler states uh that could be viewed a, a different a few different ways um one is that so that we could just simply survive because we don't have the numbers. Um, we don't have a power to fall back on to defend ourselves. So we had to make these concessions wherever we can. But I think we've made too many concessions where we fall into this liberal fallacy of self-improvement and self-help and at the expense of indigenous, black and indigenous people globally who suffer from the effects of US imperialism. And so that made me uh, as an anarchist to really like dig deep in our philosophies of place and being and realize that that also is an internationalist approach that also is global solidarity with people who are displaced dispossessed and impoverished uh, by the monster known as capitalism and so that's why we seek to you know seek justice for our palestinian relatives and we cheer on victories of our bolivian relatives who fought successfully fought back uh, a, a U.S. imperialist coup um, and why we stand with Palestine because they also suffered the same injustices of Israeli policies that deny them uh, land to sustain themselves on to clean water and they're also inheriting the pollution the effects of pollution from Israel uh, as Israel attempts to uh, develop itself further and further at the expense of Palestinian land, lives, and water. Um, so we always stand in solidarity with those who resist U.S. imperialism, those who resist capitalism, and those who seek to build healthy and dignified lives for everyone. I love what you said there, Brandon, and everything. But in particular, I was really interested in this idea of like kind of the liberal self-improvement thing. Um, cause that really is so much of like, especially, um, bless their hearts. I have so many, uh, comrades who are like, yeah, I'm going to go homestead and, you know, get off the grid kind of thing. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's cool and, and good, but also it, it doesn't actually confront. And I think there's, there's got, you, you point to this really crucial kind of dialectic where it's got to be both and right. Both the active process of decolonizing, but also the, the, the overarching project of struggling against U S imperialism and, and settler colonialism. Our struggles as the net people, as indigenous people are shared among the thousands of indigenous societies of the world. And I think it's important to stand in solidarity with all oppressed people seeking their own liberation, especially um, Black and Indigenous people in so-called U.S. And also just bringing it back to our concept of kinship, I think it is a responsibility as than the people to really become aware of the global struggles that are caused by imperialism um, and to just ensure that we are collectively um, active in trying to defeat these uh, monsters. 
I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, what's the old uh, quote? We we ain't free until all of us are free. Um, and, and recognizing those intersections is, I think, now perhaps more important than ever. Um, you know, in the past, we've spoken with our pals in the Indigenous Anarchist Federation about the intersections between indigeneity and anarchy. But I was wondering if you might comment on any specific connections that y'all see between Navajo society and anarchist praxis. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was my impression that the Navajo have had have long been proponents of, like, for example, horizontal social organizing. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how some of those um, cultural and social practices maybe inform your politics. Yeah, I feel like horizontal organizing seems to be the most practical um, going forward and just even historically, like, it doesn't make sense to be on your own and to adopt an individualistic mindset when, you know, you can't live out on your own, you know, and that's just impossible to do. And I feel like as Dine people throughout history, we we understood that and we understood like how important solidarity is, how important kinship is. And as a people, all we were was just a band of clans that stayed stick together through kinship. You know, it it, it doesn't even we weren't a nation state or wasn't who we are. We had no conception of that. We were just banded together through kinship and solidarity. And I feel like that's how we are connected to everybody throughout the world, no matter who it is, the working class, indigenous people, black and brown people, you know, just anybody who's oppressed by American imperialism or, you know, the economic hegemony of capitalism. It's beautiful. I'm getting choked up. I love the idea of like, you know, confederations of people who share nothing but kinship. Um, I think that's such a beautiful concept. It's awesome. I think the main principles of anarchism are just basically um, non hierarchical forms of self sufficiency and communal ways of taking care of each other have always existed in our societies, like Koi pointed out, um, our clans bonded us together through kinship and um, these intersect with the ideas of, or I guess mutual aid, um, which is, I would say is inherently indigenous as well um, because that is something that has just been a part of our livelihood since time immemorial. And I'm curious, do you think that that's one of the reasons why it was so natural for the info shop to sort of transition into being a hub for mutual aid after being an info shop, you know, kind of transitioning in the wake of the pandemic um, because of that sort of, um, you know, culturalized and socialized tendency towards mutual aid? Yeah. So um, when it came to the COVID pandemic, um, the info shop was definitely one of the first um, to get organized and to really distribute foods um, as soon as I hit Navajo Nation. And so um, I think that is this, I think the underlying concept of kinship and um, communal care is definitely the reason why um, community members and volunteers were so ready and so willing to risk their own lives and risk their own exposure to contracting COVID to be able to um, distribute supplies and foods to the community um, at this time. So, yeah. You just to bounce off, I mean, those, Koi and Jaden gave really great answers and uh, making me tear up too. <laughs> because uh, I think I often get too lost in the so-called academic discourse, but they really root, remind me to root, root to myself in our ways of being as uh, indigenous people, uh, specifically as Diné. And that's the reason why we started the info shop was to provide mutual aid, skill sharing, uh, provide resources that other folks normally wouldn't have access to. So our philosophy, Philosophies as Dene, as Jaden and Koi said, was, was always horizontal. We didn't have chiefs. We didn't have uh, uh, priest classes or societal 
uh, classes. Um, everything was dependent on our philosophies, our core philosophies of what it means to be Diné and to autonomously organize and to be self-sufficient, but also that self-sufficiency wasn't at the expense of like another group or the clan group. If one group wasn't able to provide for themselves, then the other group would provide for them, uh, you know, without any expectations or conditions on receiving help. And that's just the core philosophy of being the uh, uh, kinship. You know, my my great grandfather, his Navajo name was Besh Babo'i. You know, he was a farmer up in Black Mesa, Arizona. And I've told the story before on the Red Nation podcast, but he was instrumental with me, himself and my aunties and grandmas up in Black Mesa. One thing to note about Diné societies that were also matrilineal, or a matrilineal society. And so for a lot of things uh, that happen within the homestead, it's usually the women or femme among us who decide you know, what, what the best course of direct, uh, action is, uh, not by themselves, of course, but of course with counsel with everyone involved within that group. And so my aunties and grandmas up in Black Mesa were also instru instrumental in, you know, teaching me these ways of being, what it means to be Diné. And so my grandfather, my great grandfather was a farmer and uh, was a really good farmer. And he would often tell me that we were all given unique gifts and abilities and that we must provide for others uh, through these unique gifts and abilities that were given to us. So the concept of individualism right, has been turned on its head through Diné philosophy, meaning I have these unique gifts and abilities and I'm gonna use it to control others. But through Diné philosophy, you know, just the unhealthy individualism that's fostered by capitalism uh, is removed when we go through the indigenous philosophies of place and being, where we recognize that we do have unique gifts and abilities that are not to upset the balance between myself and my relations with the human and non-human, but to foster like healthy growth and healthy experiences as we continue this journey as Diné. So there's a lot of things I think within Diné society that have been distorted and disfigured and uh, mutated to uphold capitalist beliefs. And I think through Jaden and Koi and others and many more others, we're like undoing those distortions of our philosophies to what they were you know, originally what their original intent was, you know, was to continue on living as Diné. Um, there's so much to talk about how Diné philosophies of place and being relate to our current worlds, because usually it's taken from like an anthropological thing, right? Like it's like Diné people, our, our history is the past or were to be studied and that these studies are to remain in a history book or like in what I call settler from Algerhide, placed in a museum and to be looked at. But like our philosophies of place and being are alive, right? They're living, they're living philosophies, they're living life ways. And, uh, you know, with leftist ideologies and terminologies, uh, it's not like we're trying to fit the net philosophies of place and being into those ideologies, into those tendencies, but recognizing that these philosophies of place and being are also just not unique to the net people. Um, you know, there are some parts that overlap and some parts that don't. But I think that's the beauty of being Diné is that we can, you know, our philosophy is based on like taking the best of societies that surrounded us and putting it into our own and removing any structures of hierarchy that came with it. And I think that's why the Diné people were a very decentralized society, but we were like the so-called dominant power within this region because we were decentralized despite being surrounded all around by hierarchical societies. Um, and in some portions of the Navajo Nation, we continue to thrive um, with that knowledge as well. So there's power and decentralization. And it's only when we became centralized through the Navajo Business Council that eventually turned into the Navajo Nation government as we began to lose that power. Um, we began to lose our fierceness and we began to defang and declare ourselves to appease the settler society that was encroaching upon us. Um, so 
there could be a whole different podcast episode on just like the net philosophies of place and being, but uh, you know, that's how I view it is um, there's so many different, these aren't unique ideas. And I know I've listened to your podcast before where we talk about the silical nature of time, right? Um, and uh, I've always discovered that every time I came up, I thought I came up with a unique idea, somebody else had already came up with it or had written a book about it. <laughs> totally. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, for example, uh, I remember like way back in the early 2000s, and I was railing against the the anarchist fantasy of returning to the land and you know, checking out of society. And someone was like saying, like, you should read Marie Bookchin or you should read this and that. I was like, oh, okay. Finding out that people were already like touching on this. But, you know, those those books can only take me so far. And that's when I begin to lean on the net philosophy of place and being where it really pulls it all together for me and, you know, either supersedes what's already been written. Um, so there's a, so that's just the Nest Society. And it's not to say like the Nest Society is like a vacuum on this continent. There are other hierarchical societies. There are other, you know, societies whose tendencies, who display tendencies that are similar to communism and anarchism. Um, you know, prior to settler contact, there were over 2000 different uh, distinct groups of indigenous people who existed within this continent alone. And, you know, with that, with that came, you know, com complex political infrastructures, um, you know, complex ways of, you know, being diplomats <laughs> between these different societies, even though it was stateless. So I think we need to give more investigation into indigenous societies, uh, and also even now, like I, I tend to like even question like the word anarchism, um, to describe what my political tendencies are. Uh, you know, I came, you know, I first started out as a Marxist in high school, you know, read Marx, Hegel, Gramsci, and you know, all the others. And then, um, had a uh, coffee with some prominent, uh, folks in the anarcho-syndicalist community I started to drift towards anarchism uh, mainly because of my work in the cybersecurity arena and being involved with the Free Software Foundation um, and so on like other what I'd say anarchist in principles uh, organizations within the free software movement and the computer security uh, underground so to speak uh, and then I you know began to you know just question more and more and uh, am wondering and became more curious about different societies or projects that are happening now that are also removing themselves from the history of being called an anarchist or a Marxist or a Leninist, a Maoist or so on, and are building something new or not something new, but reconfiguring it to meet their own needs. And to me, that's a very dinet thing to do is like to take the pieces that make the most sense out of something that you admire and to fit it within your own um, philosophies or that's, you know, would be optimized to work best for your group. And I look at, you know, Rajava and I look at some parts of Venezuela, Argentina, even parts of Bolivia, you know, they're beginning to reject these terms of communism and anarchism, the Zapatista, uh, and they're taking, you know, the what they consider the best part of those tendencies and reconfiguring it and optimizing it for their own struggles. I mean, since we're on the subject, I, it, this is something that has fat, long fascinated me, especially because I think that you are speaking to something that I think is really crucial, right? Is that we need to stop thinking of um, these, uh, these capital A Marx or capital M Marxist or capital A anarchist figures as the um you know harbingers of of theory or the harbingers of action and we need to begin the much more like it's it's far less sexy work but it's i think it's far more urgent work of like actually trying to improve our material conditions and to look at where we're at and 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 i think you're touching on something that i have noted as well which is that like increasingly the projects that i find um the most worthy of admiration and celebration 
reject like a label entirely and and try and just do their own thing right this this sort of directly democratic anti-hierarchical sort of thing right w- whether it's uh Rojava or or the zapatistas or um the 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 uh, folks in in greece the folks in bolivia um i know that there's a lot of um there's a lot of interesting um indigenous uh struggle even between um mas uh and and uh the the, the party of um the uh oh crap why is his name it's not um why is his name uh why am i blanking on it what is the the he just won the election in bolivia evo morales right that's right there's like tension between evo morales and um some of the other indigenous uh like like confederations in bolivia um and so it's interesting thinking about like how these groups are trying to push away from socialism or communism or anarchism and forge something that's uniquely their own and 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 speaking to this idea of timelessness i'm wondering if we are entering into kind of a a a rupturous moment that looks towards trying to do something uniquely new based on the given material conditions in which people find themselves. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you, you spoke, um, so, so beautifully Brandon about, you know, how that is a Diné idea and, and, and that idea of, of place and being, and, and I'm sure we could definitely go into that for uh, at least another podcast episode, if not more. And we should absolutely do that sometime um, in the near future. You're, you're more than welcome to come back, and, and I'd love to have that conversation. But I was wondering if you could maybe touch briefly on it because I think it is such an urgent thing, um, and it, and it's so it speaks it really speaks to the moment that we are in. Um, and so it, I was wondering if you might comment a little bit more on, on kind of how you see those ideas, um, the Dinette ideas of, of, of place and being informing um, this particular moment in which we find ourselves. Yeah, thanks. I think it holds a lot of value, as Jaden was saying earlier, because it all goes back to like our core philosophy that has brought us through this moment in time, uh, kinship. And there's a saying that we have at the info shop uh, does not discriminate. And so we talk about keh and kinship and we really value the, the u- unique traits of an idea or a person or a thing, uh, the human and non-human. And this can go into things like biomimicry and, you know, rejecting the anthropomorphization of, you know, things like rivers and waters, but actually valuing what they are and, and studying them. Um, and I think that's why eh makes us internationalists because we admire and support beautiful uprisings. Uh, eh makes us anti-racist because if for Diné society, um, we have over a hundred clans and it wasn't like there was like a hundred different groups of Navajos. Like these are clans that include our Pueblo relatives, our our black relatives even, who they themselves are displaced indigenous people uh, on this continent. And so eh, really, if we, if we were to take, if we were to reinvigorate um, it as our source of strength as Diné people, as indigenous people uh, on this part of the continent, uh, it could really get us through again on, you know, reviewing these different philosophies and how instead of rejecting them as like solely Euro- Eurocentric, but to also admire that there are traits within them that are similar to ours, and that we can build upon those traits, we can build upon those tendencies to build or to weave something together that's stronger, um, to pay attention to the fringes of these tendencies of anarchism and communism and socialism. Because that's where like the interesting work is being done. And that's what people like were saying, like these, these projects that are emerging now, you know, through these cracks of these uh, rigid ideologies, the big, the capital A, the hammer and sickle and so on. Uh, you know, between those cracks, like there's, you know, flowers that are blooming and, you know, we need to admire those flowers that are appearing through these cracks. Uh, it just so happens for me that anarchism aligns close, the closest to uh, being to Diné society. And you might talk to a different Diné person and we say communism, is what you know aligns most with what it means to be Diné, and uh, so that's one part of it, right? It's like, yeah, this philosophy is beautiful and everything, but I also come from 
a position of privilege where I was born and raised on the Navajo within Diné territory. Even though I left to go to college and go to school, if I still came back, and I still have a lot of family who live on Diné territory who still retain these lifeways and are still a source of knowledge for me to reinvigorate and to reinforce and reaffirm these philosophies within me. But there's a sizable number of indigenous people who don't have that privilege, who live in urban areas, who can't go back to the land, who don't have people in their family who speak the language or know certain songs and ceremonies that could reaffirm uh, their indigenous philosophies of place and being. So on one hand, that's, it's great and admirable that we can, that we can talk about this, but to also realize that through keh and kinship, it's also incumbent upon, upon us who have these privileges to share this knowledge, to reinvigorate that knowledge within those who seek it uh, when they come home, instead of outright rejecting them as outsiders and so on. So that also builds uh, solidarity outside of these bubbles of uh, homesteading and language and ceremonies. Um, it unites us. Like kinship definitely unites us. And uh, through kinship, we are strong. Jaden, I know you wanted to, to, to mention, um, you know, you had, you mentioned you had some, a lot to say about, uh, in the, the, the kinship system. Um, you know, what does this word mean to y'all personally? I think that's maybe a, a cool place to end with. What does it mean, mean to you all as, as personal individual people and, and how does it inform your communal organizing efforts in the Navajo Nation? Yeah, so eh, me is a complex system of reciprocal kinship, and it brings with it the responsibility and to um, be active and to have effective action. Um, eh, solidarity eh, is generosity, and it's happiness and peacefulness. Um, through our efforts at the Canva Shop, um, I believe that we are um, exemplifying good kinship and being good relatives to our community, first and foremost, through um, our philosophy and mutual aid. Um, we do not support systems of hierarchy and we don't promote to gain any sort of social capital or um, personal gain over another. We encourage self-education and skill sharing and self-sufficiency, not for our own individualist um, selves, but to be able to give this knowledge back to the community and for the health of ourselves and our relatives. Um, I feel like mutual aid and um, kinship and eh, it ensures a healthy and dignified life for everyone, non-human and human relatives. Um, over the summer, um, we had volunteers who worked long and sometimes exhausting days of storing food, disinfecting um, um, supplies and items that were to be distributed. And I feel like this, this crisis gave us this opportunity to um, decentralize the power structures and to not replicate imbalances of power that we see in capitalism and colonialism. And I feel like through kinship, we can start to imagine what the foundation of life would be like, or the foundation of life would be without these, um, these monsters. Um, and um, when the pandemic affected my people, we were already, we were already, traumatized and we had already been um, stepped on by the violet boot of settler colonialism, capitalism. And we came together to make an effort and there's many other 
um, mutual aid efforts that um, that were um, conceived from the COVID crisis. Um, and I feel like uh, to me is is basically this this love for our people and for our land and to nourish our our systems of um, of kinship and our societies to be able to strengthen the health of our communities. Um, for me, I started, um, my first introduction to the word uh, came from my grandmother and she grew up um, traditional. She was born in 1945. And so she grew up herding sheep um, in an area near um, the Grand, um, not the Grand Canyon, um, Canyon de Shea. And that's where she grew up. And to her, my grandma would do anything for her family. She goes beyond and above and just drops every anything and does anything for them. And I guess to me, I would ask her like, why do you do these things? And she would always say, eh, like it's all it's all about eh, like this is just what you do for your family and for your relatives. And so to me, I see that as you express that not only to your your relatives and to your family, but you express that to everybody in society and not just people, the animals and the environment, the weather, the earth, you know, we're all related in some way and we all influence each other's. And so to me, that's what it started out as. And like Brandon was saying, um, I was like a communist and I was a self-described communist. And then I started reading more about anarchism. And I got to the point where I didn't really know what the difference was. Like at the end of the day, like <laughs> you guys basically want the same thing. and so I didn't really know where I fell on that. So I just started calling myself an anarcho-communist. But then the more and more I think about it, I'm just more Dene, whereas I just express solidarity to everybody I have relations with. And if you could call that communism or if you call it the anarchism, that's fine, I guess. But to me, I think it's more than those ideologies. Yeah, we tend to fall into like, basically like gang wars or turf wars, right? With these tendencies. And, and I think um, eh does unite us. Um, and it's not like in the liberal sense, like all tendencies matter, you know, type of thing. But like it really also uh, compels us to critically think about what does it mean to be a good relative and how am I being a good relative through my words and actions as a Diné person or as a human person? Um, am I having good am i maintaining good relations with the human and non-human such as the rivers and the mountains um that's why i really admire about eh, is that it brought us from several apocalypses <laughs> uh that you know extend beyond uh european invasion but through our creation stories as the net people we had faced apocalypses before we had faced world ending events before um and then we had built our philosophies from surviving those so-called world-ending events and continue to thrive and continue to grow and pursue uh what we call which is a life of balance and peace and harmony and honjon is basically unattainable but it's the journey to reach honjon is what matters i guess um like ultimate balance ultimate beauty ultimate peace um but we must strive to reach it every day as the net and i think it's kind of i think it's a uh, racist or a uh, paternalist to think that we must fit into these ideologies even though we self i self-describe myself as an anarchist uh the net anarchist but you know we reserve the right as indigenous people to seek the best tools and resources among around that surround us and to incorporate that into our own philosophies of place and being. Uh, Cause like I said, we don't, there's no Diné constitution, right? There's no document that cannot be edited without, you know, three fourths of the male population of Navajo people <laughs> voting on it. 
it's like we can we can take <laughs> on these ideas we can take on these different tools that exist and philosophies that exist around us because ultimately they you know as koi said we all want the same thing we all want healthy dignified lives um it's just having to convince people that they are worthy of healthy and dignified lives without upsetting the balance uh, between ourselves and with uh, the non-human. That's why Ke is maintaining that kinship, like true meaningful kinship. Gosh, this, is so, this has been such a beautiful conversation, y'all. Thank you so, so much for coming on the program. I, I've been really looking forward to this conversation ever since I heard about the info shop and the wonderful work that y'all have been doing. So I'm really glad we were able to link up and dialogue together before we part ways. Where can listeners go to follow you online and how can they support your life-saving mutual aid efforts? Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, Jaden and Koi were instrumental in helping it. So we had a partnership with Navajo housing authority which is a HUD program, a federal HUD program, basically, that provides housing for uh, certain income levels on the Navajo Nation. And our info shop is what I would say is cozy. <laughs> uh, it's located in central Window Rock area with a high traffic area, which is why we chose it. But in order for us to provide more mutual aid, we're still providing mutual aid now, but in order for us to go back to the capacity that we were at before uh, NHA took the house back from us, um, we're doing a fundraising effort to basically buy land and to build our own structures and to build our own commune, um, you know, enacting these philosophies of place and being, but also being very uh, politically active and internationalist. Uh, so not to build a homestead to escape from U.S. imperialism, but to build a base to directly fight U.S. imperialism. Uh, within that, the Navajo Nation, within the Net Territory. Um, so you can go to keinfoshop.org slash donate. And uh, we partnered, even though we ourselves are not a nonprofit, we do have a fiscal sponsor. And so if, if uh, you want to make a donation, you can make tax deductible donations there to help us with our, our land back program. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, seriously, y'all, this has been so, so great. Uh, I, I've learned a bunch just listening to y'all. And uh, normally I talk a lot more in this podcast and I've just kind of been sitting here listening and learning and just loving every moment of it. So thank you all so much, so much, so much. Um, obviously, uh, we have got to do this again sometime because uh, I want to talk more about these ideas of, of place and being and, and, and sort of um, thinking towards the future. So we'll have to circle back sometime in the near future, maybe in the new year and, and, and have another conversation. Um, but Koi, Jaden and, and Brandon, thank you guys so much. Love and solidarity. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. I can come back to us again in a good way. i go on it. And that about does it for this week's episode of coffee with comrades. This is an entirely DIY show run by workers for workers. If you like what you hear, you can follow us on Twitter at CoffeeWComrades and Instagram at CoffeeWithComrades. Check out our website, www.CoffeeWithComrades.com, and sign up to support our work with a monthly contribution by going to www.Patreon.com forward slash CoffeeWithComrades. You can find Coffee with Comrades on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you go to get your anti-capitalist propaganda. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're there smashing that subscribe button, be sure to rate and review the show as well to help us increase our reach. If you have feedback, criticism, or you'd just like to get in touch with us, shoot us an email at coffeewithcomrades at gmail.com. Until next time, stay wild out there, folks.